citizen. Oh, oh, oh. Out of many we are. We are world citizen. Same vision is for equal rights and justice. For the people, them, what's happening to this beautiful world that we're living in? World citizen, lift up your voice. Hello, I'm Arthur Canegas, and I welcome you to another episode of the People Powered Planet podcast, where each week we have extraordinary solutionaries. While other podcasts may focus on all the problems of the world, we start with the problems and then we visualize how can the world solve this? What would it look like to build the alternatives? Many people have discovered that in their personal lives, their visualizing helps create their reality. We want to do that for the world. And so today we are taking on a tough topic. Uh, we're taking on the topic of the World Court of Justice, which is the uh, legal arm of the United Nations, having issued an order to Russia to halt the invasion of uh, Ukraine. And we're going to talk about uh, about that and, and then move into visualizing the alternatives. We're going to have uh, several special guests with us today. Uh, of course, Bill Bloom who is a administrative law judge, former administrative law judge, and he's written extensively about international law uh, and, and its application of court orders, not only uh, to Russia here, but in Nicaragua, to Israel, uh, to, the, to the U.S. And uh, we'll be getting to him uh, uh, shortly first. But I also want to mention that we have a very special guest, uh, Ora Canagas, who is the Director of Public Policy and Advocacy for the American Friends Service Committee, which is the Quaker group in Washington, D.C., uh, which helps bring uh, peace, uh, help, helps, helps bring peace to, to people in Palestine and around the world. Uh, and then we have Mark Ottinger. We'll get to him. He's the, uh, a, a very active uh, lawyer in Vermont who worked with Gary Davis and is the principal drafter of the statute for the World Court of Human Rights, and David Gallup, who heads the World Citizen Government. Uh, let me start with Bill Bloom. Uh, Bill, uh, tell us a little bit more about what has happened with the World Court of Justice, uh, what the World Court of Justice is, and what, it, what, what its uh, recent ruling, uh, tell us about its recent ruling. Sure. Uh, okay. So first of all, my last name is Blum. Just think Blum. of it as, as rhyming with drum or, or dumb. I apologize. Bill that's that, that's quite all right. So <laughs> uh, let me get right to it. I've written about um, developments before the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court. And these are two complementary uh, judicial bodies, but they're very different. The International Court of Justice, what we also call the World Court, is the principal judicial organ of the United Nations and it hears disputes between nations. And that court on March 16 issued a provisional order of protection requiring Russia to immediately suspend its military operations in Ukraine and ordering both countries to take no further acts of aggravation in the situation. And of course, that order has been completely ignored by Russia. Now, yeah, uh, at, the same, at the same time, isn't that uh, officially, according to treaties, isn't that officially a legally binding? Uh, isn't that court decision legally binding? Yes, it is. Every member of the United Nations is a member of the ICJ. But here's where the problem comes in. Not every member of the ICJ, and in fact, only 73 uh, uh, United Nations members, accept the compulsory jurisdiction of the ICJ. So that means the vast majority don't. The United States withdrew from compulsory jurisdiction in um, 1985 over the Nicaragua case so that was brought against it way back then. So this uh, case comes before the ICJ, not pursuant to the court's compulsory jurisdiction, but pursuant to a treaty to which both Ukraine and Russia are signatories. That's mainly, that's namely the Treaty on the Prevention of Genocide from 1948. And, and the case gets before the ICJ in a rather interesting uh, fashion, uh, shepherded by good lawyers. The lawyers say that Russia used 
the pretext of genocide committed in the Donbas region to justify its invasion of the entire country, thereby giving the court jurisdiction to hear its claim about the uh, military operation. So the ICJ and the ICC, they're similar to domestic courts in that the first order of business is, does this court have jurisdiction to hear the dispute? So there's limited jurisdiction before the ICJ, and this is how the case came before the tribunal. And the order of March 16 was a jurisdictional uh, order as well as a provisional order, similar to a preliminary injunction in the United States. And the court said, yes, we have jurisdiction to hear this case. The treaty does give us jurisdiction. And pursuant to that jurisdiction, we as a provisional measure will order Russia to immediately suspend its military operations. A hearing on the merits will be held, a trial on the merits will be held at some point in the future. Now, it's also important to note that Russia did not participate in the proceeding, in the provisional proceeding. They withdrew from that case. They sent a letter to The Hague, to the Peace Palace where the court sits saying, we're withdrawing, we object to your jurisdiction, we're not participating. That is not the first time a state party has done that before the ICJ, the United States did it in the Nicaragua case. The ICC, on the other hand, Here's prosecutions for war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and in some instances, wars of aggression brought against individuals. So not countries, but against individuals. The ICC also has limited jurisdiction. It takes cases when uh, state parties to the Rome statute, that's the statute that created the ICC, request an investigation. It can also take up cases upon a referral by the Security Council of the United Nations. It can also take up cases on its own motion, which is initially how it got involved in Ukraine, but then it has to go through a pretrial chamber of the court for approval. So what happened here was that 39 states, and now it's up to 41, requested that the prosecutor of the ICC open an investigation. That has happened. There is an ongoing and will be an ongoing investigation of war crimes, uh, crimes against humanity and genocide in the territory of Ukraine. And if anyone is found, uh, if there's reasonable cause to believe that they've committed those acts, they may be indicted, and in the future, should they travel to the territory of a state party, they could be arrested and brought to trial before the ICC, which also sits in The Hague. So that's just a capsule summary of what's going on. And there is a history of heads of state actually being uh, arrested when they've tried to travel after having court orders against them, correct? That's right. Uh, the, the, the most famous um, indictee, I think, of the ICC was Gaddafi. And interestingly enough, they also indicted his son. And that indictment is still pending. And my understanding is that the son is going to run for president of Libya. But he's mm-hmm. subject. It, it's, it's very interesting, uh, to say the least, from, from a legal standpoint, and I think also from a political standpoint. Right. Now, you mentioned Nicaragua. Uh, I know you've written about that as well. Um, what was the case? What was what was what was the case uh, that happened there briefly, just very briefly? And what is the how, how can how is the U.S. responding to the enforcement of international well, law? Well, uh, Nicaragua brought a case in the ICJ alleging that the United States was illegally uh, funneling money to the Contra rebels who were seeking to overthrow the government of Nicaragua and that the US was also mining the harbors of Nicaragua. And the the ICJ held a a hearing, a provisional hearing to determine jurisdiction. And when the court uh, found that it had jurisdiction to hear the case, the US withdrew from compulsory jurisdiction. Nonetheless, the case proceeded and there was a full scale trial at The Hague, I attended it. As a member of the press corps, I met the members of uh, the Nicaragua legal delegation. Uh, A hearing was held. The United States had a judge on the court who acted as a defense attorney for the United States. So U.S. interests really were presented before the court. And um, at the end of the process, 
the um, court awarded uh, damages to the uh, government of Nicaragua, which uh, I believe were in the neighborhood of $17 billion, and I don't believe that's ever been paid. So the United States uh, is pretty much, uh, well, I don't want to go too far, but the United States is often a scoff law as far as international law is concerned when its sovereign interests are in conflict with international law. Well, that's kind of a key point that leads us into a, a question for our, our next participant, Ora Canagas, who's Director of Public Policy for the, and Advocacy for the American Friends Service Committee. Um, so here we have major powers violating international law, attacking small countries or committing acts of criminal acts, really, in those countries, and they can be scuff laws. Uh, tell us, or what you see as uh, the bigger picture, if we step back here, of how this affects uh, uh, life on Earth and humanity and where we need to move forward if we're going to be able to uh, create enforceable law at a global level. Thanks. Um, Bill, I'll say that one, one way to ensure that your name is pronounced right on a, on a show is to um, interview with your family members. They, they do very well with pronunciation. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, so thanks, Dad. Uh, um, oh, you're welcome, yeah, right. Mark Venegas. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I want to start off by saying that, that Ukraine um, is just one of many violent contexts currently raging across the globe, um, in which it's clear that our toolkit is completely lacking for, for addressing acts of state violence globally. Um, and um, many of those contexts uh, involve uh, U.S. actions or the aftermath of U.S. actions. Um, and I, I think many of those um, contexts involve um, countries outside of Europe or non-Christian populations, and they get much less attention. So uh, I, I want to start right off by saying that um, when people turn to us for like, you got to do something, solutions about Ukraine, um, you know, we, we see an, an element of um, yes, and in that moment of, um, you know, we, we have created a context in which it is acceptable for what's happening in Ukraine to happen. And it has been um, acceptable to global media, to, um, to people at large, when it's happening in countries with brown people, or sort of outside of, you know, the, the sense of, of who we care about. And you even see a lot of racist reporting saying, you know, but these are Europeans, these are civilized people, it could be us. Um, and it, it really brings home uh, what we have allowed to be acceptable um, globally outside of the realm of, of powerful countries centering themselves. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I want to say as a Quaker advocate for, for over 25 years, I see um, two, two real clear themes in this moment. Um, one is that when we come to these inevitable moments of um, threatened populations, in, you know, in, incredible and unspeakable, um, you know, death and displacement that are what war brings, um, there's a natural and correct urge to do something, do something. Um, and, and this is not the moment where there's much useful we can do. Um, we've put a paradigm in place which fully centers military approaches. Um, you know, the, the, the very important processes um, that Bill was speaking to notwithstanding, um, we've, we've invested over half of the US discretionary budget in military spending for years to the exclusion of other approaches for investment, staffing, research and development. We've approached the world in a very simplified good guys and bad guys framing that eschews history and future and the spectrum of nuance in the present. And, and our toolkit is incredibly weak beyond the scope of military and co coercive economic approaches. So powerful countries with the US at the top of that list um, have ensured that institution of international law are weak and don't have enforcement mechanisms, so they, they can do as they please. I think Afghanistan and Iraq are perfect examples of this. Um, well, and, and you know, so accountability has really been traded for a model of might breaks, makes right. And then the, the second clear theme that I just want to point out is that, that the burden of proof for demonstrating effectiveness of potential solutions to global problems exists only for mili non-military means. So when you talk about long-term peace building, when you talk about, for example, the, the International Court of Justice and those pieces, people say, blah, 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 but people are dying now. What do you, um, yes. And 
how many violent contexts in the last 20 years have been improved by sending more arms? Um, how many ways have military intervention really succeeded in, um, in protecting, um, protecting people? You, know, you, you don't often see the evaluations and cost benefits analysis imposed on military approaches. Um, did 20 years of occupation in Afghanistan serve Afghans um, or the world at large well? Um, were Libyans lives saved by US airstrikes in, in 2011, 2012? Um, you know, hmm. Has the war on terror brought more security and stability to the world over the past 20 years? Um, and, and yet military yep. engagement is seen as you know, the, the complete and infallible answer to the, to the imperative to do something. Well, you, you raise a very, very good question and make a very good point uh, that uh, the definition of insanity has often been said when you keep doing the same thing over and over again and it doesn't work in you, so you do it harder and more. And uh, you know, here we had, uh, first of all, when, when Russia was the Soviet Union, uh, they're trying to conquer, you know, trying to fight the people of Afghanistan and despite overwhelming power disparity, couldn't do it. And the U.S. in 20 years of battling, of, you know, you know reigning on this poor country only pushed them more into the hands of Taliban and more uh, into extremist uh, directions. And so uh, then still we, we, we moved to sanctions. Is there, inside, is there a clue here to how this is solved for what happens inside countries? Uh, Gary Davis, the, 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 the person who inspired this People Powered Planet podcast uh, uh, in our film, The World Is My Country, uh, said that, you know, Inside every country on the earth, murder is illegal, uh, but outside it isn't. Uh, isn't abolishing war simply a matter of applying the same law at a, at a global level that, that if the world is our right. country? Yeah, I, I think we, we, set, we set our, you know, the boundaries of what behaviors we will normalize at every societal level, the local, the national, the global. Um, and, and there's no reason our moral codes should end at state boundaries um, with no serious movement to abolish war. And I will say that as an organization that works both domestically and globally, I see the same failure of imagination um, at play in the world stage as, as is at play in our, in our community stages. You know, we, um, you know, we, we, um, are in this discussion about, about policing and there's an in inability to imagine um, a world beyond policing where, where you have community institutions and approaches that, that ensure our well-being you know, without coercive force. Um, and when you think about it, where you really feel safe is not necessarily where there are 20 locks on the door and you know, armed people outside the doors, but um, but where you know your neighbors, where it's friendly, where people have the things they need. Um, so there is not, you know, you know, and, and you know, our focus on, um, on militarism is so all encompassing that, that we don't think about the ways that accountability happens without a sort of a militarized enforcement mechanism in thousands of ways in our lives. Um, yeah. And so, well, yes, the court mechanisms are an important piece of that and building upon that to an idea of accountability that is enforced in a spectrum of ways societally, I think is important. Yeah, uh, it's interesting that military power, I think is an oxymoron, uh, a, a, a word that contains this contradiction because it's not military power, it's military powerlessness. When huge empires, little countries like, like Vietnam, like Afghanistan, despite years and years and huge disparities of money and funds and so on and can't beat them, you have to ask, is there really such a thing as military power? And if people say, well, okay, but look at Ukraine, their military power, that's working. They're able to hold off this big empire. Well, you and I, or uh, our grand, my grandfather, your great grandfather came from Lithuania. And when I went back there, I got to interview the first head of state of Lithuania, they were the first country to break away from the Soviet Union. And, uh, and they broke away with a singing revolution. Uh, <laughs> and that singing revolution greeted the uh, invading Soviet army, just like we're seeing in Ukraine, tanks, the whole works, uh, the mighty Soviet state, not allowing the, the first, first any country to break away from it. And their entire revolution, they had 14 deaths. They mourned those people who got killed, the, the demonstrators. 
but they use nonviolent revolution. Even our tour guide said I was on the top. I was on the. T I climbed up the TV tower and I was saying, you know, tanks are coming down Revolution Ave Avenue or something. And then everybody would not run away from the tanks. They'd all converge on the tanks and block them. And even haven't we even seen some examples of that um, in uh, in Ukraine? And isn't actually uh, aren't there actually much more powerful forces than military? It isn't. Isn't isn't, yeah. isn't there something there's better great, than military? There's great scholarship on that as well. There, you know, the the research is great on the much greater success of of nonviolent resistance movements or or largely nonviolent resistance movements um, globally. So let's take that next to the next step. Uh, it seems like there's two key elements to an alternative to war. Uh, one is nonviolent power. But the second big one is, of course, law. I mean, that inside countries, as Gary says, we've, we've actually found a way to abolish wars. Uh, you know, Oklahoma, when, when there's a terrorist act even in the U.S., like when, when, uh, when the Tim McVeigh blew up the federal building, Oklahoma didn't declare war on Michigan for harboring the Michigan militia. <laughs> you know, it was handled as a criminal justice uh, issue. Well, with that, I'd like to, uh, to briefly turn to Mark Ottinger, who, uh, is actually working to not only uh, uh, envision and say there ought to be, there ought to be a law. Uh, he's actually been working to follow up on Gary Davis's idea that 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 we actually uh, institute and create a world court of human just human rights, uh, and uh, that this is actually a direct way to follow up on the UN Charter. That's a missing element. Um, Perhaps uh, we could start with a brief clip of uh, of Gary's bold action in, in declaring that court and have you tell us a little bit more about how bottom up people powered democracy might be able to move forward to begin to create uh, some advances in international law. On September 4th, 1953, from the City Hall of Ellsworth, Maine, I declared a government of, by, and for the people of the world. Today on my 90th birthday, by this historic opera house where the United Nations was declared, I, Gary Davis, coordinator of the World Citizen Government, hereby declare de jure the world court of human rights, tasked with the solemn duty of protecting the rights and freedoms of all human beings on the face of the earth. It shall be the mandate of this court to uphold legally our inalienable rights as codified by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, declared unanimously by the United Nations in 1948. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, it's in your hands now. Mark, it's in, it's in your hands now. Um, that uh, how, how have you begun to follow up on on Gary's uh, uh, Gary's creative initiative? You know, he he was some he was a great inspiration until he, he of course he passed away in 2013. But a great inspiration as someone who was willing to just boldly act on the things that we all say ought to happen. Uh, tell us a little bit how you're carrying out that bold action. Um, by well, the way, thanks. before you do, let me just add that Mark is a very active international and, and uh, a lawyer in, in Burlington, handling all kinds of cases. He's doing court sh shortly after this podcast, and he uh, is uh, uh, deals with immigration issues and all kinds of international law issues, and uh, he has been and worked with Gary Davis. Uh, go ahead, Mark. <laughs> Thank you, Arthur, and thanks for having me on. Um, I'd like to pick up where Bill uh, Blum left off. He mentioned that the ICJ and the ICC are complementary courts. Well, the basic idea behind the World Court of Human Rights would it would be a third complementary court, the third uh, leg of the stool, if you will, um, to the extent that the ICJ adjudicates treaty disputes between and among nation states, and to the extent that the ICC prosecutes individuals for war crimes and the like, uh, the World Court of Human Rights would be have a more direct impact on what Gary just mentioned is that the rights of all human beings. Essentially, it would be a forum uh, in which classes of individuals, such as hypothetically 6 million uh, Syrian refugees or the Rohingya 
you know, represented as a class against um, against uh, Syria, against uh, China, as the case may be, um, where the objective is not to to sort of solve a disagreement between and among nation states or to prosecute an individual for things from the distant past, but would rather be to mitigate, to ameliorate large scale, um, you know, high, high sort of incidents of violations of human rights on behalf of in real time uh, to try and alleviate currently what is going on. So um, we created a statute through an international collaboration. Uh, it would be a treaty based organization. It would be aside from or separate from the United Nations, but it would have to be incubated in the United Nations. And, um, and so we're very much in the sort of medium stage stages of trying to make that happen. If I can comment briefly on the recent order of the International Court of Justice, I would essentially point out that, yes, it's, it's kind of an odd fit for a petition like that because of the fact that sort of the individuals, the Ukrainian population is not directly uh, implicated. And because the Russians can essentially withdraw from the mandatory jurisdiction of the court, uh, enforceability becomes a big problem. Now, I, I will have to say, however, that the old concept of naming and shaming is really seeing um, a, a tremendously, uh, you know, popular uh, scrutiny right now. And by naming and shaming, my, I essentially mean that even in cases where a country is being called to task for human rights violations, even if it's not technically enforceable within that country, because they are not a signatory to the treaty or to the mandatory jurisdiction in the case of the ICJ, there are real positive benefits of the type of publicity that attends a decision of a supranational or above the national level court. And I think this is the first um, global war that I've um, been aware of where the, one of the first things that happens is that the involved, the affected country files a petition in court. That's kind of a new concept. And it's a reflection of the evolution of public international law of the increased incidence of countries signing on to treaties that are basically uh, that implicate human rights issues. And I think it's a step in a very good direction. Um, I'm working with a group called Cinema for Peace in Berlin, which uh, basically does film work uh, regarding international human rights protection. Um, they're looking to potentially do a series of documentaries, sort of Ken Burns style, um, about, uh, let's say, cases that the ICC hasn't pursued or, or can't pursue. Um, and my feeling, again, is that what we're doing with the World Court of Human Rights has less to do with criminal prosecution and more to do with trying to alleviate human suffering in real time. Um, so that's, that's where we are going with the World Court of Human Rights. But I think these are, these are important days for the future of public international law. And I think that when petitions are filed with the ICJ and the ICC, even if the fit is not perfect, I think that um, you know, having this out in front of the world's population uh, will make them all more aware of the resources that are available, of the terrible needs that exist, and the possible solutions. Uh, you mentioned solutionaries, that, um, that if, if we continue to work on expanding public international law, that can make a real difference for, for individuals going forward. Well, it's so important that you've mentioned the uh, naming and shaming element, and that is to say that the way law works, even in our own country, is not just because you, you don't do something because, uh, you know, a policeman is going to be right there enforcing it. It becomes part of the acceptable norm of the society. It becomes the way you behave. You stop at a red light. You don't say, oh, I don't see a, a cop car around. I'm just going to go right through. You know, it's, uh, it becomes part of the acceptable ways we behave. And, uh, and, and, it, and it shifts the whole nature of it. And I think in international law, we see where, you know, one country attacking another country will just, no matter how right they are, it's going to all the population of that country is going to be up in arms against it. But when they see a, an international court uh, enforcing something, the reaction will be different. Uh, what are some of the, I think that's what you put it was really key as we talk about a people powered planet, which is how individuals can then even be involved in enforcement. Um, what if, if your court were uh, uh, more, more advanced, were in place, uh, we've seen in the current situation on both sides, claims of human rights violations uh, from, from Russia against Ukraine and Ukraine against Russia. How would you see your court uh, dealing with uh, that current situation? 
Well, I would see that a petition filed by, let's say, the, uh, the class of individuals who are the Ukrainian public, uh, a petition filed with the World Court of Human Rights addressing the manner in which uh, Russia, the Russian Federation is violating public international law through its aggression. I mean, we know that Putin is trying, at least within the, uh, the Russian media, which he controls, is trying to pass this, uh, this invasion or this operation off on the allegation that, that Ukraine is somehow in, in becoming Nazified um, is the way in which the term gets translated. Um, I'm unaware of any evidence to that effect, but I mean, that's the internal Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin sort of um, zeitgeist that he is trying to, to essentially use within the country by controlling the media um, to essentially prevent his citizens from, from rising up against him. Um, you know, if in fact there were to be a World Court of Human Rights, and if in fact a petition were to be filed on behalf of Ukrainian citizens against uh, the Russian Federation, I would envision a uh, thoughtful, uh, probably a preliminary order to keep the status quo, and then a final order, which would essentially find facts, um, compare those facts to the law as it exists with respect to public international law. And there are a variety of public international laws, not just the anti-genocide commission, but the, you know, the, the laws regarding uh, the, the rights of women, the rights of children, uh, many of the human rights uh, treaties that have been adopted under the sort of aegis, if you will, of the, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights since 1948. Um, and you would get an, a scholarly, uh, essentially dissertation as to the extent to which, if at all, it is inviolate that the Russian Federation's actions are in violation of public international law, and what that body of international law requires by way of actions on the part of Russian, the Russian Federation, and also other implicated countries, for example, Poland, as they receive refugees by the millions out of Ukraine, um, you know, what the, the public uh, international law requires uh, those countries to do. Uh, obviously, the largest burden would fall on Russia, but some subsidiary issues would presumably fall to the countries that are sort of getting the diaspora from the entire thing. And it would be subject, you would assume, to uh, reimbursement by Russian Federation for the costs that they have essentially given rise to. Um, I should point out that the World Court of Human Rights is presently envisioned would not also, just, just like it doesn't deal with uh, criminal prosecution, it's not currently envisioned to deal with uh, civil damages. So this idea of $17 billion worth of reparations owed to Nicaragua, uh, that would not be something within the currently contemplated purview of the World Court of Human Rights. It is essentially would be a roadmap to, here's what you need to do now in order to uh, prevent more people from suffering and in order to put an end to the suffering of those that are currently displaced. Hmm. Well, you've raised some, some very good points. Now, many people have been working to advance world uh, international law, basically treaty-based law, by trying to appeal to the current system to reform itself. Bucky Fuller said, you, you, you create a better model and move toward it. Um, uh, as Gary, as we noticed in that little clip, he declared <laughs> a government of by and for the people of the world. Now, that first sounds like kind of an, an, an outrageous thing to do. Uh, why, why, why did that make any sense for just some guy to say that, uh, David? Let's start with you and then talk about where we move from there. Uh, thanks, Arthur. Yeah. Well, power emanates from us uh, as individuals, political power. Uh, it's us, the people who create law and who have to enforce law. And certainly I would say creating a common world law. So if you shoot someone on the streets of Baghdad or you shoot someone on the streets of Washington, D.C., that is within those countries, that's murder. But outside of those countries, that's not murder. In fact, there are uh, the Geneva Conventions, international humanitarian law that says you can uh, fight, you can have a, a, a war of ag aggression uh, as long as it's quick, as long as it doesn't uh, specifically target uh, civilians, uh, if it's winnable, if it's for self-defense. But we know almost all wars now are offensive um, and majority of deaths are by civilians. And we're seeing that now, not just, as, as Ora said, not just in uh, Ukraine, but in Central African Re Republic, in Ethiopia, and, and uh, all, all these other, there's at least 13 or 14 wars going on in the world right now. And I'd like to quote 
uh, well, there's two quotes that are very similar. One from Grenville Clark, who was a lawyer who wrote a, a, a book with another lawyer named Lewis Sohn back in the 1940s and 50s called World Peace Through Law. He said that uh, there can be no peace without uh, justice. There can be no justice without law, and there can be no uh, law without government. Uh, ben Ferenz, uh, the last living, he's 102, prosecutor of the Nuremberg, uh, tribunal, he said something very similar. There can also be uh, no uh, peace without justice, no justice without law, and no meaningful law without a court to decide just and lawful uh, um, prosecution under any given circumstance. And I would take both of those quotes and move beyond that and say there cannot be world peace without world justice. There can be no world justice uh, without world law, and there can be no world law without world government. So we've been talking about law here, uh, all of us to some degree, but Arthur, your question really said, let's bring this beyond the law because working within the system doesn't always uh, function as, as we know. So how do we go beyond that? And, and or I liked your term of mechanisms of accountability. Uh, and we do have new tools uh, for as mechanisms of accountability beyond law. Um, I recently wrote a, a blog about DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations and how we the people can uh, even govern our own communities and potentially the world through a federation of decentralized autonomous organizations. And what's so beautiful about that tool, this new online uh, mechanism is that it's a stored information on a ledger, people can vote, uh, it prevents uh, fraud, uh, it can allow people to actually get benefits from participating in, in voting on how they want to improve their community. And if we make a whole bunch of DAOs, if every uh, city or town makes a DAO and then federates with other DAOs around the world, we could actually be governing our world in a, in a decentralized uh, fashion, but where everybody could participate and will feel the power uh, and vested interest of their vote. So that's certainly a new tool. I would say is that another kind of, tool. Is that kind of an evolution of what Gary first advocated when he talked about uh, Syntegrity groups and talked about uh, these these groups of, of people doing things like this Zoom meeting, but across on opposite sides of political issues, using having kind of a framework that brings people together instead of our current political framework, which breaks people apart and pits them against each other. Something which has the uh, has the uh, kind of a, the toolkit, the kind of uh, mechanisms that can allow us to. Uh, reach a chord across and find out what is our common humanity? What are the ways we come together? Because the odd part of it is that here we have a world full of people trying to do good. Everybody is trying to do, you know, the, the, the suicide bomber is so dedicated to, to, his, to, his, to his people or to Allah, to God, that he's willing to die for it. All over the world, we have people willing to, to die for and struggle for what, what, what based on the information they're getting, is right, but we have a real discrepancy of information. We're all getting different bodies of information and then we're pitting against each other. But the cool, interesting thing is that the basic motive of every human being is to have a better life for their family, to help, help others, to care about people. So somehow it's a disjointed system that's pitting us against each other, giving us disinformation. And there are system changes we can make that can, instead of tearing us apart, bring us together and move us toward the reality that, hey folks, if we don't get together here on planet earth, we're doomed, we're, we're destroying ourselves now. These uh, ecocide and, and more, uh, more than ever, we're, we're faced again with the risk that nuclear war could wipe out all of us. Uh, so we really do need to get together a new system that breaks through and I'm glad you're working on exploring it. Um, I guess we're getting, I'll let you comment more on that, but I'd like to throw it open to questions. We have 20 more minutes and if there are other people who'd like to talk or if any of the panelists have questions or comments they'd like to make of each other. Uh, let me be quiet a little while and let you talk. Uh, Melanie, you wanna handle this period? Actually, Arthur, I, I just wanted to make one more comment which would be important for if Gary were alive and he were here to, to talk, he would say, well, the other, other tools besides our online and democratization tools well, just seeing ourselves as world citizens. And that was what Gary thought was so important is to start self-identifying all of us as world citizens. So if we see that we're not just, you know, Ukrainian or Russian or Chinese or American or whatever, but world citizens, then we can start working together on that level. But we have to choose that. And that's what Gary Davis was doing his entire adult life. That's what I'm continuing here 
through this world citizen government is to give people this tool of, you might say, identity of, as world citizens to help bring us together. Well, that is so important. And I think you could mention briefly before we turn it over that uh, how, how, how are you implementing the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that was passed unanimously by the UN? How are you implementing world law in that area? Well, Article 6 of the Declaration says everyone has the right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law. That means each of us, no matter where we find ourselves on planet Earth, we are already world citizens. We already have our rights and duties, and we should be able to respect them. We have, through document identification, providing, for example, this world passport uh, to people around the world who desperately are in need of a document, or whether it's that or a birth certificate. We also have a legal advocacy team that provides legal briefs to refugees and stateless persons who are either have found a safe haven and are trying to stay there but need proof and evidence to back up their claim, or for people who are trying to find a safe haven, we also provide affidavits of support and legal letters to help them. So it's both through legal advocacy and through documentation, as well as education of the general public. One of the great things that just really quickly, I'll say that we're going to be starting world citizen clubs on high school and college campuses to get the youth of the world involved in this idea of what does it mean to have rights and duties as a human being in this 21st century on planet Earth. Excellent. Um, so do we have some questions, uh, Melanie, at this point? Yes, we do. And thank you so much, Arthur. And thank you, panelists. This is so interesting, so rich. Um, I'd like to follow up with David Gallup's comment uh, about world citizenship, because adding the top layer is so important to see us as a whole. We are one big community, one big tribe, and we all survive together. If we work together, we all survive together and move away. We need to move away from the domination system to the partnerism system. Um, yay. So um, I'm going to go ahead with our first question. We have Joanne. Joanne, go right ahead. I just want to say I wanted to uh, applaud um, all of you for your information. It's been highly valuable. Um, I do have a question about uh, uh, litigation regarding the, the war and uh, probably Mr. Putin's actions. I have a, a friend who is very active in the NGO community. And when I ask him about the ICC, he says, well, you know, there are problems there. Uh, and it's uh, what he has, has been hearing is that there is a, an effort towards an independent uh, court, similar to Nuremberg, I guess, or Rwanda or Yugoslavia that's in the making. Is he referring, Mark, to what you're doing? What I think uh, may be being referred to are these sort of tribunals that are occasionally convened for a particular conflict. Uh, there was one in Kosovo. Um, one of my friends was one of the war crimes judge there. For example, he handled a case involving forced uh, organ uh, harvesting, if you will. A horrific case, three judge panel, 500 page decision. Um, these specialty courts, and again, there's debate within the international um, judicial circles as to whether more specialty courts are needed or more general courts. Uh, I think these specialty courts tend to arise because of the particular need for you know, punishment on the one hand, reconciliation on another hand, um, sort of on a region by region basis in response to particular uh, warlike activities or particular war crimes or aggressions. Um, but I think that the ultimate solution lies in the creation of a more globally focused approach, whether it be initially a treaty based, uh, third treaty based supranational court with more of a human rights focus. Um, because I think even though people like, like Gary Davis advocated for world government, and ultimately I, I love the uh, quotations that David had, um, my, what I always told Gary Davis is that I will not see world government during my lifetime. And so what I would like to do in the meantime is to continue working as I have throughout my career in international judicial system work um, to try and accomplish what may be an intermediate step um, to eventually that world government. And that is, you know, as I said, a third leg of a stool of supranational courts that continues to support uh, the increasing national uh, signing on to treaties and the increasing, I call it a web of public international law, as you have nation states connected by a treaty or multilateral treaties like 
such as the you know civil and, and uh, political rights treaty at this point connecting the vast majority of the world's 193 countries and so as more you have more and more countries signing on to more and more uh, public international law you have something that mimics um, world law but of course it does not emanate from a world legislative branch and so it can't really be considered world law i'm just a bit of a realist perhaps trying to do what i can during my lifetime um, as opposed to hoping um, that we can achieve the final end product um, within that short period of time so it's one step at a time for me can i add one thing the united states and Russia are not parties to the Rome statute of the ICC. We've never been a party to the ICC statute. So that's a huge limitation. And in fact, American law, US law prohibits the United States from joining the ICC because we're afraid that our soldiers will be prosecuted. There is a, an amendment to that law, the American Service Members Protection Act, which allows us to participate in uh, cases involving genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity for other countries, but not for us. And another limitation with the ICC generally is that wars of aggression don't fall within the jurisdiction of the ICC and the Rome Statute unless you're a state member. And that's why these special tribunals are being talked about for the Ukraine situation, because the statute of the ICC, the Rome Statute, wouldn't reach the situation in Ukraine. Those specialty courts are created by the UN for Rwanda, Yugoslavia, long before that for Nuremberg. So there are various options. One other option legally is for domestic courts to prosecute international crime. That's not to say that what Gary is promoting is not vitally important. I'm just trying to flesh out the legal landscape as it currently exists. And if I could just sort of respond to that quickly, um, you know, there's a big difference between courts whose goal is criminal prosecution and therefore punishment of one or more individuals. Uh, there's very, that's a very different sort of an outcome or what we call a remedy in the law from trying to alleviate current real time human rights suffering. And, you know, my feeling is that, you know, again, I'm not a highly uh, religious person, but, you know, it's isn't there somewhere the statement that, you know, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And my personal feeling is that the law should be less involved in bringing vengeance against those who violate the law, as opposed to helping the victims of laws that are currently being violated, especially when they, the, the extent of their suffering is great and the extent of their numbers is large. And if you look at the proposed case selection methodology for the World Court of Human Rights, you, know, you will see something like the US Supreme Court's uh, principles of writ of certiorari. Um, the World Court of Human Rights would not take every case that came before it. It would sift the cases, as does the U.S. Supreme Court, to try and decide which cases are most um, important from a jurisdictional standpoint, which cases uh, have the promise of resolving uh, disputes between and among, in this case, nation states or other, uh, uh, other supranational courts. Um, you know, the U.S. Supreme Court gets 10,000 petitions a year. They take roughly 75 cases per year. Uh, the World Court of Human Rights would be the same. And so they would prioritize the cases where the human rights violations are numerous and serious and address those. And in the in nation states where, where the countries have signed on, it would be domestic law and the decisions of a World Court of Human Rights would be enforceable in those domestic courts. And even for those courts that were not uh, members of the treaty, um, the naming and shaming factors would still be applicable. And that the, actually in the selection of cases, the enforceability piece is very much stated in the statute, the proposed statute, as a factor in the court's determination as to whether to take the case. You know, sort of the theory being, if it's not going to do that much good anyway, because of the relative lack of enforceability, then maybe we should, you know, uh, attend to other matters where the impact of our decision making will be more profound and more meaningful. Great, back and forth, and we have time for two more questions. So we'll go to Richard. Richard, go right ahead. Thank you all very much for uh, this uh, enlightening uh, discussion uh, this afternoon, or this morning out your way. Uh, we've been talking about uh, what happens after an abuse, uh, after a crime has been committed, uh, either individually or by states. 
Uh, what about preventing uh, abuses in the first place? Uh, could the United Nations have binding arbitration of mediation uh, for state-to-state -state, uh, disagreements? Um, here in Canada, we have binding arbitration for essential uh, workers uh, in, in industries that are deemed essential. Um, and, you know, it, it looked like with Ukraine, uh, that there was, quote, some negotiation b beforehand. Um, various heads of government w went to see uh, Putin, uh, but everybody seemed to have uh, uh, fixed uh, criteria before they entered the room that they were not negotiable. And uh, so I'm wondering if there's a way to have binding arbitration. I've been working with uh, Rotarian Ernest Thiessen uh, here in Canada, who's come up with a computer program called Smart Settle that uh, is, uh, helps in mediation and inevitably when it's put to uh, cases such as Ukraine and Russia, it comes out with something that is better than the status quo. And I'm thinking also with Rotary International, it's partners with Mediators Beyond Borders, uh, which is also another organization. Uh, a neutral or organization that could help with mediation. But I'm wondering if there's a way to have a binding arbitration, mediation, uh, that could uh, uh, settle these problems before they become wars. Bill, you want to take a crack at that first? And I'd certainly <laughs> like one too. Well, I think it um, certainly can be built right into a treaty that there be mediation and there are international uh, bodies. The Permanent Court of Arbitration also sits in the Peace Palace in the Hague. So yes, there are courts designed to do this. The problem that uh, I see over and over again with international law is that it's uh, voluntary. And when you have sovereign states that are bad actors on the world scene and they uh, have not, um, that our power has not yet been diminished. They they don't see an interest in sitting down at the arbitration table. So th this, this is a perpetual problem and it's one that we continue to address. And I will turn it over to uh, Mark now. So I've had a couple of interesting experiences with alternative dispute resolution and their reaction to my comments about it um, when I travel around the world. Uh, in most common law jurisdictions, such as Canada for the most part, except for Quebec, um, they would say, oh, yeah, ADR, alternative dispute resolution, which includes mediation, negotiation, arbitration, um, is so much quicker and cheaper. And it's, you know, it's, it can be private. So it preserves the relationship between, let's say, two business partners uh, over the long term. Uh, they resolve this dispute and get back to doing business. Um, the civil law reaction, where everybody gets to court more quickly and gets a shorter period of time in court, they get due process faster, but less of it. That's a big generalization. But their response is, oh my God, ADR is much too uh, time consuming and expensive. And so it depends, you know, what you, how you view ADR depends apparently on what kind of a due process system you have. As Bill says, yeah, you can build an ADR requirement into any convention. And I think that some of them do. Um, mm -hmm. The only other thing I'd like to mention is that the uh, ICJ and also the uh, World Court of Human Rights as envisioned have provisions of um, advisory jurisdiction, which is almost in a similar way. Because if you want to, if you want to say, is is the Russian Federation's invasion of Ukraine under this, you know, allegation that there's Nazification going on, is that justified as a matter of law? Um, that that can be adjudicated after the fact, which is what they've proposed to do and what's going on right now. Or you could actually apply and, and Putin could say, you know, I'm really thinking about invading Ukraine. You know what I'll do is I'll go to the International Court of Justice or to the World Court of Human Rights and say, is that OK? Um, theoretically, that could happen. Uh, and it sounds far fetched, but I'm not being entirely sarcastic. Um, and I know, for you know, take, for example, uh, Bill knows more about the ICJ than I do, but I always use an example of a dispute between Canada and the United States regarding the, their fishing treaty. And there was a question about, okay, so this is Maine and this is whatever's north of Maine, um, St. John's or whatever. And so where's the line go? Is it go horizontally around the longitude or does it go sort of perpendicular to the, to the, pat, to the uh, coast where, where the 
between the US Canadian border is. And they submitted that to the, uh, to the ICJ and anecdotally at least they got a decision and guess what? They lived with it. So that was a wonderful example of you know, two nation states sitting down saying, you know, there's this ambiguity in our treaty. Let's go to the ICJ, submit it to them, whatever they say goes. So that's a wonderful example. Um, and that, that same sort of thing could happen in other contexts. Um, and so, yes, I'm a big supporter of ADR. It's just, uh, I'll leave it there. Yeah, I, love I mean, that. I think something that I find interesting in, in that, that discussion is that, you know, that you, you really see the role that norms play I mean, there, there, is, there are enforcement mechanisms, but I think being in Washington the last six years or so, um, you really see the way that um, norms are the bulk of what makes systems work. Um, because you have something like the Trump administration that says, no, nah, I'm really not gonna promulgate those regulations. And, and you don't have mechanisms for accountability in place because you have operated on, on norms <laughs> and, and you know, there's really not a, a system for when those norms break down. And I think in some ways, the breakdown of you know, a shared set of facts globally, <laughs> and a shared, I mean, we're in this, this sort of precarious moment where a lot of the systems that have been functional are shaky. Um, and, and maybe that's a moment where a wholesale reevaluation of, of, of accountability mechanisms and of our norms around you know, what is the world we want to live in globally, domestically? I mean, we have all the tools to destroy each other millions of times over. So then it becomes a system of choices around, around what we want power to look like, life to look like. Um, and I think, um, you know, the, the, the moment that we have with Ukraine, I think it, Bill made the point earlier, it suddenly, or maybe it was Mark had said, you know, Suddenly, people are interested in international law, <laughs> and that's you know the silver lining in this moment is is suddenly you have power seeing the usefulness of of global mechanisms and maybe shifts in norms. Melanie, I'll go back to you. Thanks. I love that. I love that, Laura. And this is so exciting. It's a beautiful example, Mark. Um, now, our last question we have, Bud. Bud, go right ahead. So um, uh, I'll try to be quick. We're running out of time, I see, but. Um, Aura, thank you. That uh, the power of cultural norms to create standards of behavior are critical. And it, as, it, as we know, everything begins with uh, consciousness and awareness and moves from there into changing human behavior. And that's really what we're focusing on ultimately. So if, if Zelensky calls for the disillusion of the United Nations because they're ineffective in their diplomatic negotiating, um, and, on, and anything that they agree to is unenforceable, where do we go from there? So I would make a point to reference people to perhaps look at the experience of the Gaviotis community uh, founded in back in the 1970s by Paolo Ligari. He said something to the effect that, look, um, the policeman, the, the priest, the judge, the jury, um, everyone involved in all these institutions um, are, the, the institutions are unnecessary because the qualities of all the players in those institutions dwell in the hearts of every resident of Gaviotis. And therefore the institutions are unnecessary because people were, are self-governing and, and committed to those higher standards of cultural behavioral norms. Anyway, my question though may go more to um, Mark and, and a little bit as well to Bill. Um, given the horrific human suffering, I put this in the, in the chat, it's totally appropriate to focus on human-centric rights. However, I'm really curious about the movement to defend the rights of nature. And uh, given Mark's interest in supernational uh, court systems, could one consider that the devastation and the irre irreplaceable and irreparable damage to the environment that war brings could be both um, prosecuted and legislated? I was in a podcast recently with a guy named Jonathan Granoff, um, who heads the global Jonathan, security. I know Jonathan is a good friend. So he, was, he heads the Global Security Institute. He curates oh. the World Peace Prize winners. He was there with um, Jane Goodall. So they raised the question of, you know, what about 
you know, the Lorax question is what I call it. Do trees have standing, right? And who speaks for the trees? And of course, she raises the, the related question, well, what about the animals? Who speaks for the animals? Are, should, this, should my court that you know, we've been working on be the world court of human, um, animal, and natural rights or something like that? And my answer Everything would be, more than human. Right. Um, and my answer would be to the extent that the rights of the environment um, or the rights of animals are, you know, specifically set out as the rights, you know, as independent rights, then yes, there should be adjudication around that. I, I'm concerned, though, if we try and name any kind of right that might be protected by a world court of human rights, that we would kind of be doing a disservice by focusing on some rights, potentially at the expense of others. Uh, but I completely agree with you. I would let the, the jurisprudence, basically the case law of a World Court of Human Rights, begin to sort of gather. Uh, and from that, we would be able to determine to what extent the environment has rights that are protected under public international law, and the same with respect to animals. And so I don't have any problem with the idea of um, you know, matters of, of uh, ecocide and matters of fauna and flora being the subject of public international law cases. I think that's something that will follow naturally. Um, I'll say one more thing and then I'll stop for, for the rest of the show. And that is that one of the questions I often get, I was at an NGO, a, a Jewish NGO in Washington, DC. And they asked me the question, so would this World Court of Human Rights be likely to determine that uh, Palestine has a right to an independent state? In other words, would this court order that a part of Israel is gonna be confiscated essentially? And which raises the question of what are called uh, political versus legal questions or justiciable versus non-justiciable questions. And at some point, the courts have a limit uh, in terms of going to questions that are truly political in nature, questions that are to be adjudicated by legislative bodies, okay, as opposed to judicial bodies. I mean, ju judges are just supposed to review legislation for, for constitutionality, or in this case, if for compliance with public international law. Um, and so that issue of what's justiciable, what is not, what is political, what is legal, is an interesting issue. But I, I'm, I fall with you that nature and animal rights should be legal rights subject to court adjudication. Well, ultimately, perhaps um, creating a culture in service to all life. <laughs> yeah, and I think that could evolve from the jurisprudence of the court. Just one, one quick point. The, the ICJ has a very broad advisory opinion jurisdiction when it's uh, asked to exercise it by the Security Council. One really interesting case occurred in 2008 involving the wall that Israel built through the West Bank. That wall was adjudicated in violation, to be in violation of international law. And uh, I think if you read through that um, discussion, that opinion, you'll see that concerns with the disruption of the natural uh, ecosystem were part of that. Uh, I, this isn't really at the heart of your question whether they're standing on behalf of the environment, but I do see that those concerns can be integrated into the current structure, the, the uh, current uh, system uh, under which the ICJ operates. And of course, the World Court is envisioned by, by Mark, uh, perhaps would be much more uh, amenable to it. Uh, Aura, would you like to add? The question of um, moving to, to rights and, and broader human rights, um, you know, in, some, in some ways when political rights are not held as sort of sacred and separate apart from human rights, um, you have a better system overall. I think, um, you know, again, the, the, the question of, of um, you know, existence of various countries and countries' rights to do certain things um, have completely trumped the, the bottom line of human rights in many contexts, um, including that one. Um, and, and, you know, we need to reimagine, a, you know, a global network that has, has really outlived, um, you know, the, the political system is the political system of a hundred years ago, um, of, a, of a settler colonial world, of, of, a, of norms that um, that we've reevaluated in, in many, many contexts and, and really need to think through how to, how to build a world that has a bottom line of, of human rights and natural rights, animal rights um, at its core. Yeah. Exactly. And nonviolence, more partnerism, 
less domination. Um, we'd like to end it there. Thank you so much. I'm going to send it back to Arthur. I so appreciate all of you for being here and staying a little late. Okay, back to you, Arthur. Take it away. Thank you, all the panelists. And Aura, that was a, a terrific closing comment. I think that's really the crux of, of, uh, of what we're trying to do here. And I do want to urge everybody uh, to take a look at each of the uh, articles and links that we had in the announcement uh, of today's podcast, if you go back to peoplepoweredplanet.com, because there uh, you'll see uh, more extraordinary things that, that our panelists have written and done on this uh, issue. The key to all this, you know, it, it was mentioned, uh, Cinema for Peace, Mark, Mark mentioned. And, you know, our whole idea here is that if we can create this vision of the alternative and we can get this vision implanted into the popular culture through movies and TV shows and so on, uh, we can start planting the seeds for the shift we want. Uh, as was just mentioned, uh, the world is realizing the old system doesn't work, but they have no model for an alternative. You know, people, <laughs> if you abolish you and what do you put in its place? Just, 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 just at one ending war and the end of humanity? Or do we have a vision for some alternative? And we really uh, have, Martin Sheen's advocated a, a series that could help us uh, uh, get this vision out into the public. The key thing we need for all this to work is 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 funding we've got a we've got a really cool idea here that the world needs the world wants the world needs this bottom up right it fits so much in with what's happening with cryptocurrencies and all kinds of things breaking outside of the old uh old systems and starting to create something new there's a coming together of humanity that's already happening on the planet with with people all over googling solutions connecting together doing things that's so beyond that old hundred year old broken nation state system uh, and all we need is that vision to really get out there into the popular culture and help coalesce all this incredible energy we have, and we can unleash the superpower. I mean, it looks like we're helpless, but that's because we're locked in these boxes called nation states. When we rise out of it, we the people are the superpower. And so next week, we're going to have a, a working group panel. We have a terrific opportunity where the, our film, The World is My Country, is going out on uh, on Link TV out to uh, 40 million homes and so on. And we're lining up sponsors. We've been busy working on that this week. And this is going to be a, uh, an actual working session where you can join us in helping us to find sponsors uh, uh, to uh, help provide that financial background we need to move this forward. And then uh, the week, the, the, after that, we have Rian Eisler, who wrote The Chalice and the Blade, and is, and is going to help us envision what would a more partnership society look like? What did it look like way in the past, and how can it do so in the future? And Melanie is going to play a key role in that because she really feels like this is the core of what Gary talked about when he said we create a people-powered planet. It's, it is a partnership kind of system, not a top-down dominator model. But I'd like to give each panelist a, a few moments to say a last word if they would like to uh, add something. Uh, uh, David, would you like to add something before we close? The law is important to uh, our everyday lives locally and globally. But I think, once again, just to reiterate, seeing ourselves as world citizens and claiming that status will be the key to bringing humanity together. Bill, do you have another concluding uh, comment? Sure. Uh, what I think uh, people should do in the short run is demand that the Biden administration rejoin the compulsory jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. The United States finally went on to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. It's about time. Vital, that's so vital, thank you. And, uh, uh, and uh, Mark, you have another comment and, and a place you want people to go? To look uh, at we report? could just di direct them to the worldcourtofhumanrights.net uh, which is a recently refurbished uh, version of a website that's been in existence for, I don't know, between five and 10 years since, um, since we started this work in 2013 or so. Um, I would also like to basically say that uh, keep the momentum that seems to have been created by the greater degree of attention that is being afforded um, supranational courts through this Ukrainian um, filing of petitions um, talk about it, tell your friends about it. Uh, the way we are going to get to a more global degree of governance is when people demand it, and they're not going to demand it until they better understand it, uh, until they understand that they have a voice in making it happen. So I think that just um, spreading the word is what I would recommend. 
No, that's perfect, Mark. And then I'm going to turn to Orr for the final concluding uh, concluding remark on this. I would just say that I, I agree with the other panelists. I think Bill's point about the ICC is essential. I mean, we can't sort of exempt the U.S. from international law again and again, and then uh, suddenly when it's when it's not us, be like, oh, suddenly <laughs> suddenly we agree to these de definitions of, and and enforcement. It's not how it works. Um, and I think. Um, you know, again, living into a system where, where, as Mark says, we hold on to this moment where there is a, a recognition of the need for international law and build on it. And, and also, again, you know, we are in this time of chaos uh, at, at so many levels, it, it, you know, apocalypse in its, in its sort of essential meaning of, you know, things breaking apart um, and people envision um, that that kind of breaking brings war and displacement and shortage and 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 we have choices in that um and and being a force for saying uh we choose the world we want um international law does not have to be weak we've chosen that system um you know a a, a crime and punishment paradigm uh, is not the only way to run uh, a, a family a city a community a, a country or a globe um, and we have a choice about what accountability mechanisms can look like at all those levels. Um, and as we grow in how we think about everything from parenting to um, community institutions, we can grow at the global level as well. Um, and uh, I think we can all be part of making those choices every day. Wow, beautiful, beautiful concluding comment. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Join us next week and every week at the People Powered Planet podcast and do sign up to be a member if you can. And that'll help both uh, uh, that'll help give us uh, support to continue this work as we carry on in the future. Thank you for joining us in another episode of the People Powered Planet podcast. World citizen, lift up your voices. Oh, you know we got something to say. All we need is the same directions heading in one way. One way. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to our channel and like this video.